once you've had an opportunity to give, I want you to stand with me. I'm going to share a message with you this morning that I've entitled A Line in the Sand. A Line in the Sand. This is a subject I've been spoken about before, but I want you to just continue to give me more insight into these verses found in the book of John, chapter 7, and verse 37. It says, In the last day, that great day of the feast, Jesus stood and cried, saying, If any man thirst, let him come unto me and drink. He that believeth on me, as the scripture hath said, out of his belly shall flow rivers of living water. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word. Lord, open our spiritual eyes and ears. Let us receive from heaven. Let your word be spoken to us and let it be reflected through us. In Jesus' holy name we pray. And everyone said, Amen. Amen. And you can be seated. I want to speak to you for a few minutes about the time that Jesus wrote in the dirt. I know a lot of people uh, believe that the Bible doesn't tell us when he wrote it. It actually does. I know when I was growing up in church, I was told, you know, we don't know what he wrote. And so I never really looked for it. Because I, I told him, he, you know, he, he don't know, that doesn't tell us. But after you know, years of studying, I've come to the uh, realization that the Bible does show us what he wrote. And I'm going to show you that. I'm also going to show you how we need to, to know what he wrote. And we need to remember why he wrote it. See, we're living in the last days on, on God's timetable. And God is pouring His Spirit out upon all flesh. And I want you for a moment to try to put yourself in Israel during this feast that was taking place. It was the Feast of Sukkot, also called the Feast of Tabernacles. And on the last day of this feast, one of the things that would take place is the priest would march to the temple. Several priests and, and uh, the ones that would be carrying willow branches, they would wave them as they took a step. Every step they would wave the branch. And you'd hear the sound of wind. And then behind those priests would be other priests, some that had pitchers of water and other pitchers of wine. And they would be pouring out the water and wine as you would hear the wind. And this was a, a picture of what would take place uh, on the day of Pentecost. If you remember on the day of Pentecost, there was a sound, there was a rushing mighty wind, and God poured His Spirit out. Amen. So this was a rehearsal for that day. You know, God would pour out His Spirit in the, in the upper room because Jesus had been given as a sacrifice. And uh, when he, before He died, He promised, He said, I must go so that the other Comforter would come. Amen. And it was during this time of the feast when they celebrate the fountain of living water, that Jesus stood and cried. I'll read it again. It says, in the last day, that great day of the feast, Jesus stood and cried. Now, I want you to imagine, I was trying to think of a festival that we have that, that we're all familiar with. The only thing I could come up with right away was Christmas. You know, during Christmas, we tell the children that, you know, St. Nick is going to maybe bring them gifts or something to that effect, you know, different varieties of that. But we know there's a time of gift giving. And if somebody stood up uh, during a Christmas play or something and said, listen, if you want a gift from above, come to me and I'll bring you the gift. And some people might be saying, well, that guy thinks he's Santa Claus, you know. And that's kind of what was happening here. Jesus, they're, they're, they're celebrating the festival of the outpouring of God's Holy Spirit. The water and wine represents the blood of Jesus. You know, he, he said that his, his body would be broken, his blood would be shed for the remission of our sins. And he would give us life, eternal life. And it's during this time, the last day, that great day of the feast, Jesus stood and cried, saying, If any man thirst, let him come unto me and drink. He that believeth on me, as the scripture has said, out of his belly shall flow rivers of living water. He's saying, I'm going to give you life, eternal life. But this he spake of the Spirit, which they that believed on him should receive. For the Holy Ghost was not yet given, because Jesus was not yet glorified. See, he's talking about being filled with the Holy Ghost. And being born again. He's talking about spiritual life, eternal life. That's what he was talking about. If any man thirst, let him come unto me and drink. Out of his belly shall flow rivers of living water. Jesus was talking about the price that he would pay at Calvary, becoming a sacrifice, 
He's talking about the day of Pentecost. He's saying, I am the fountain of living water. And immediately upon hearing him say this, a lot of the people realized that he was calling himself the Messiah, the fountain of living water. Some believed him and some didn't. Some thought he was crazy. They knew he was claiming to be the giver of life. And so the priest, in order to prove that he wasn't who he said he was, decided to entrap him with a question. They brought a woman who was condemned to death before him. And they said, look, this woman was caught in the act of adultery. In the very act. In other words, they were saying she's guilty. No need for a trial. You're the judge. The law says stone her. What do you say? They had him trapped. Because if he said stone her, they would say, how can you be the giver of life if you're having some of these things? What a joke. If he said, don't stone her, they would say, how can you be the giver of life? You don't follow the law. So they asked the question. This woman was caught in the very act of adultery. The law says stone her. What do you say? Yes or no? Either answer, we got you. If you say, yes, stone her, we, we, we've got you. If you say, no, don't stone her, we've got you. John chapter 7, verse 40, many of the people, therefore, when they heard this saying, said, of a truth, this is the prophet. Others said, this is the Christ. But some said, shall Christ come out of Galilee? Had not the scripture said that Christ cometh out of the seed of David, out of the town of Bethlehem where David was? So there was a division among the people because of him. So, so people were, you know, divided. Some believed he was the Messiah, some didn't. And the priest came up with this plan. And so on the following day, when Jesus comes into town, the priests approach him. In John chapter 8, beginning in verse 1, Jesus went unto the Mount of Olives, and early in the morning, he came again into the temple, and all the people came unto him. And he sat down, and he talked to them. So, so I want you to picture this. Jesus is here at the temple now. He's not hiding. And I can see the people gathered around, and he's teaching them there. And the, the scribes and the Pharisees brought unto him a woman taken in adultery. And when they had sent her in the midst, so I can imagine these guys coming and creating, if you will, like a sinner circle around Jesus. They gathered around. And they put this woman in the middle. They placed her in the midst. And they said unto him, Master, this woman was taken in adultery. In the very act, now Moses and the law commanded us that such should be stoned, but what do you say? Wow, they were out for blood. <laughs> the law says she should be killed. And it's interesting too because it says that she was caught in the act of adultery. But how did they catch her and not the guy? See, because the law of Moses talks about both people, the man and the woman. But somehow these priests found this woman. I don't know how they knew where to find her. Hello. And knew what she'd be doing at the time. This was a setup. They were out for blood. They were, I don't know why it is, but some people feel like if they step on others, that it makes them stand higher, look better. We're, we're easy to condemn, we're easy to judge. But God says, let a man examine himself. Amen? We should only judge ourselves, not others. We're not qualified. But people do it all the time. Uh, Jesse Duplantis said once he was in an airplane flying and, uh, it, before he had his own plane. And, uh, passenger next to him turned around and said, what do you do for a living? And he said, during that time, there was ministers on television that had been caught you know, uh, being unfaithful. And he said he didn't even want to say he was a television preacher. He didn't, uh, he didn't want to tell the guy. He said, what do you do for a living? And he goes, well, I'm an evangelist. And the guy says, evangelist? You must be like that guy on TV, that famous guy. You know? He said, uh, what do you think about that? That guy's cheating on his wife, you know, while in the ministry. And, uh, how dare he? He said, he, he started condemning this evangelist. And Jesse stopped him. He said, well, hold on. He said, let's not talk about him because he's not here right now. He said, let's talk about us. He said, you ever cheat on your wife? And the guy said, oh, 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 He said, well, tell me, have you? He said, I mean, 
No need to talk about the other guy. The other guy's not here to defend himself. But we're here. He's not there to cheat on my wife. Have you cheated on your wife? And the guy just, oh, he got up and walked away and went and sat in another seat. Jesse said there was a lady sitting there behind me. She turned over and said, I barely done it. <laughs> Woo, we like to say, lock them up, throw away the key. We like to judge other people. People rise their blood, but Jesus didn't come to judge or condemn. Jesus came to give his own blood, amen, for the sins of others. In 1 Corinthians 11, 28, it says, But let a man examine himself, and so let it be to that bread and drink to that cup. Man, we're all ready to point our fingers at other people, but we've got to be careful. Because when we do that, when we point our fingers at somebody, we got three more pointing back at us. Oh, that ought to be a reminder. When we point to somebody, we got three more fingers pointing back. The Bible says, let a man examine himself. We ought to examine ourselves. And let God judge everyone else. Amen? We're all ready to judge, but God is the, the righteous judge. They brought this woman who was caught in the act of committing adultery. They had stones in their hand, and they were ready to kill her. And they said, what do you say? The law of Moses says that she should be stoned. What do you say? And he stooped down and started writing on the ground as if he didn't even hear them. And they questioned him some more. Well, what do you say? The law says, what do you say? We want to know. They had this plan to discredit Jesus. What are you going to do about it? They had him trapped. John 8, 6, it says, This they said, tempting him, that they might have to accuse him. But Jesus stooped down, and with his finger he wrote in the ground, as though he heard them not. When they continued asking him, he lifted up himself and said unto them, He that is without sin among you, let him first cast his stone down. I love this. You can see they told Jesus, The law says, Moses, the law of Moses said, she should be stoned. What do you say? He said, well, stone her. That's the law. Follow the law. That's what Jesus mm -hmm. said. But he qualified. He said, let he who is without sin among you cast the first stone. And then he stooped back down and kept writing. Now, I always used to think that Jesus said, let he who is without sin cast the first stone. But he didn't say that. And I'm glad he didn't because, see, he was without sin. And he would have been saying that. I'll cast the first stone. He didn't say that. If you read it very carefully, he said, let he who is without sin among you cast the first stone. Now these priests knew that they weren't without sin. They were just as guilty as she was. Maybe not for the same sin, but what difference does he make? See, sometimes we like to judge other people and say, well, our sin is not as bad. Do you hear what that guy did? Ooh, he's terrible. I mean, I just should have cheated on my dad. I just lie about these things. I just do this. And, but that guy, oh, he said, hey, sin is sin. And the wages of sin is death. Oh. And the Bible says this, all men, all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. We know those priests weren't perfect. They all had sin. And Jesus stooped down again and began to ride on the ground. And they which heard it being convicted by their own conscience, this is John 8, 8, went out one by one, this is very important, beginning at the eldest, even unto the last, to the youngest. And Jesus was left alone, and the woman standing in the midst. What I want you to see here is that Jesus didn't condemn them. And Jesus didn't convict them. He just did what he was supposed to do. He said, let he who is about sin among you cast the first stone. And he stooped down and kept writing. And it says that the oldest priest, you got to understand these festivals. I used to attend the Catholic Church and we would have festivals every year. Every year, the festival. Same time, almost every year. And we worked with them. My dad would call the bingo, you know, and and Mom and I, we, we ran the candy group. And, and we did it every year. And I remember as a little kid learning how to do it. And, and by the time I was 12, well, I could run that booth by myself, you know. Because I had already done it year after year after year. And these priests worked this festival. This was the festival of Sukkot. 
And in the last day, that great day of the feast, it was the festival of the pouring out of the water and the wine and the wind branches. It was a, it was a rehearsal for the, the day of Pentecost. And uh, you know, they knew all the verses about the, the fountain of living water because this is what it was about. And Jesus just claimed himself to be the fountain of living water. And the, and the old priest knew that. He, he understood. He worked that priest, I mean, that festival all his life. He probably worked that festival 50 years. He knew every verse about the fountain of living water. And he sees Jesus stoop down and keep writing. And, and Jesus just said, hey, let me use that to the money you cast the first show. He knew he wouldn't qualify. He knew none of them would qualify. He knew they brought this woman and they didn't care about her. She would be killed just as an example, just to try to get somebody else. She was collateral damage in their mind. They didn't care about her. But then Jesus got personal. That he was about to sit among you, cast the first stone. And they stood down and started riding with him. And the old man knew he was riding with him. Because the old man had read it before. I tell you, that verse is becoming one of my favorites, the one that says, let a man examine himself. And so let him eat that bread and drink that cup. We ought to examine ourselves. Amen? Everyone's quick to judge others. But we should all be quick to examine ourselves and slow to judge others. Jesus didn't have to judge these guys. He simply wrote in the sand and they were convicted by their own conscience. In John 8, 10, it says, when Jesus lifted up himself, and he saw no one but the woman. He said to her, Woman, where are those thine accusers? Has no man condemned thee? And I, and I believe when he said that, when he said, Has no man condemned thee? I believe he was shaking his head like this. Woman, where are your accusers? Has no man condemned thee? And she wisely said, No man. See, a judge isn't there to condemn you. A judge is just there to hear the case. I got a traffic ticket once. And uh, I was on, um, I don't know what the cross street was. Maybe, maybe West Park. Making a right turn on Harwood Avenue. And if you know Harwood Avenue in Houston, it's a busy street. And I pulled up to the light, to the red light. And, uh, and I saw that I could go, I turned right. And I may not have come to a complete stop, but you know, on Harvard Avenue, if you can go, you go. You know, it's just a busy street. And I saw those police officers in the corner. I saw him. I, I wasn't paying attention. To I mean, I saw him there. I made a right turn, and he came after me. He said, you know, you didn't come to a complete stop. I said, office. It's Harvard Avenue. I said, you know, I said, you can turn right, you take the turn, you know. I, I said, I saw you sitting there in the corner. He said, you saw me? I said, yeah. He goes, well, he said, at least you're honest. He said, I'm going to write you a ticket. I said, oh, thanks, man. <laughs> I was hoping you'd be merciful, you know. He said, well, I'm going to show you a little bit of mercy. He said, I'm not going to go to court. He said, if you go to court and uh, I'm not there, he said, they're going to let you go. And I thought, well, that's my punishment for running the light. I guess I have to, you know, take that to court. And I did. I went to court, and the judge said, uh, Richard Rodriguez, I stood up to the hearing. He said, is the officer that wrote the ticket here? And the lady said, Mr. Rodriguez, you're free to go. See, because he's not there to judge. He wasn't there. He doesn't know if I'm going to not. I have to have an accuser there. And if the accuser's not there, then the judge says, you're free to go. And that's what Jesus did. See, they asked Jesus a legal question. They said, you're the judge. This is the, the, the situation. She's guilty. We caught her in the very act. The crime is punishable by death. What are you going to do? He said, let he who's about to know you cast the first stone. And he's writing in the sand. And they, they're convicted themselves by something. I'm going to tell you what it was in a second. But they all walk away. And he looks up and he says, woman, where are your accusers? Who wrote the ticket? Who accused you of a crime? No one? I think he was shaking his head to give her a clue. He, give me the right answer. Say no one. And she said, no one. He said, neither do I do. I'm, I'm the judge. I didn't see that. But he says, but he wisely says, go and sin no more. And so Jesus takes a woman who was condemned to death and he gives her life, he gives her freedom. Proving to everyone there that he is who he said he was. What an amazing event. What an amazing event. 
He said, neither do I get him to go and sin no more. What a beautiful story. What a beautiful event. And I can see him doing it. He's not here to accuse. He didn't come to condemn the world. But he, came, he didn't come for blood. He came to shed his blood. Amen? John 3.17 says, For God sent not his son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. For years it's been questioning, you know, what did Jesus write in, in the sand? The Bible does tell us. There's two things that happened in my life that uh, showed me what he wrote. One of them was I simply heard a man talking about it, and I, and I researched what he said and, and found it was true. But the other is I was doing a funeral service, and, and I do many of these as a minister. I do a lot of funeral services, and I was at this funeral, and uh, we were getting ready to do the gravesite service where the, you know, the burial takes place. And so I, I always lead the, the, the casket, the coffin, I lead it to the location. And as I was doing that, I wanted to make sure I didn't step on any ant piles or uh, on any of the, uh, the markers that were on the ground. And so I looked down as I walked. And as I was walking, I looked down and I saw Gustavo Rodriguez. We kept walking. Michael James. Van Wynn. And it hit me that their names were written in the earth. And I thought about Jesus stooping down and writing in the earth. We've done this for years. For hundreds of years, maybe thousands of years. When we bury somebody, we write their name. Now, today we've got fancy, we put it on plaques and metal things, but. <laughs> The names were in the earth. See, Jesus was talking about eternal life and eternity. And there's a there's a scripture in the Old Testament book of Jeremiah that talks about the fountain of living water. And it tells us what he's going to do. It gives us a prophecy of what the fountain of living water is going to do when he's rejected. You see, Jesus just stood up on the last day of the feast and said, If any man thirsts, let him come to me and, and drink. I will bless the full rivers of living water. In other words, I'll give you eternal life. I am the river of life. I am the fountain of living water. And they rejected him. And in Jeremiah 17, 13, it says this, O Lord, the hope of Israel, all that forsake thee shall be ashamed, and they that depart from me shall be written in the earth, because they have forsaken the Lord, the fountain of living waters. The Bible prophesied to us that when Jesus claimed to be the fountain of living water, those that rejected him, he would write their names in the earth. The old priest knew that. And when the old priest saw Jesus stoop down and start writing, he knew what he was doing. And it says that he walked up. And I imagine when he looked down and saw Rabbi Joseph Gore. He probably took a look at Jesus and thought, he might be the guy. This man may just be who he said he is. I'm sorry. I'll have no part of it. He dropped the rock. I'm not judging anybody today who walked away. I can imagine the, the next oldest priest, maybe a man in his early 50s, saying, Rabbi Gordon just left. Where's he going? And he walks up there and he sees Levi. You know? And he sees him writing his name. He knows the verse too. He's fulfilling prophecy. He's doing what the Bible says he's going to do. And I'm doing what the Bible said I shouldn't do. I'm rejecting the fountain of living water. And he drops a stone. And it says he left from the oldest to the youngest. I imagine the youngest priest went up there. This might have been his first festival. He might not have known about this verse. He may not know what was going on. He walked there and saw the name and said, I don't know what's going on, but I'm believing. Amen. Everybody says, I'm not going to think about myself. He dropped that stone and he left too. Wow. See, Jesus didn't come to condemn the world. But that the world through him might be saved. I was listening to something today before I came in here to preach. And uh, there was an attorney who was working on a case in Alaska. He said they were in the Aleutian Islands in Alaska. And he had just finished working on a case. 
him and a, another attorney. And they were going to fly back to Anchorage, <clears throat> which was about an hour and a half flight. And they were at the airport, they had their tickets in hand, and a minister came up to them and said, Hey guys, I flew over here in a small private plane. I'm getting ready to fly back to Anchorage. Why don't y'all just save those tickets and y'all fly back with me? And the attorney said, No, I, you know, we already got our tickets, we'll just take this flight. He said, No, you got to come with me. So you can save some money, you can use those tickets later on. And, and this attorney says, Against my better judgment, we said, Okay, we'll go with you. He said, so we went with this guy out to where his private plane was. He said, I was happy to see that the plane was pretty plain, <laughs> shiny. And he said, I got in the plane, sat in the front by the pilot, and my, my partner went and sat in the back seat. He said the plane started really nice, and they started headed toward the runway, taxiing to the runway. And while they were doing that, he, uh, he said to the minister, he said, can we pray before we fly out here? The minister said, yeah, we can, because we don't normally do that, but uh, we can. And he said, well, I want us to pray. Turns out. And he said he prayed a long time. <laughs> like, I did prayer, you know. And he said that that plane took off from the runway and went up into the sky. They were doing pretty good, I guess maybe four or five minutes into the flight. And then you could see ahead there was clouds, and they were starting to get into the clouds. And he said the pilot turned to him and said, uh, we're about to enter some clouds. I can't fly in the clouds. And the attorney said, what? <laughs> he said, I can't fly in the clouds. I, I, I pass out. He said, what do you mean you pass out? He said, the guy said, uh, uh, and his eyes rolled back and he passed out. He said, his, his partner back to him, hey, are we going to die? And he said, there's a good possibility. And he said, they tried to wake this guy up, and the guy was out. And there in this plane up in the sky, he can't see anything. Don't know anything about flying the plane. He said, get the radio and, and call somebody. And so the guy got the radio and said, hello, hello, anybody out there, hello, hello. And, and, and a voice came back and said, hello, do you guys have no radio etiquette at all? He said, sir, we don't know radio etiquette. We don't know anything. We're in an airplane, and the pilot just passed out, and we don't know what we're doing. We don't know a thing. He said, the voice came back on and said, well, look, I'm on a freighter that just left Anchorage. I'll circle around so y'all don't lose radio contact with me, and I'll call Anchorage Tower, and they'll help you land that plane. And he said, they just waited. A few minutes later, you heard a voice. This is Anchorage Tower. I understand you guys are in the plane and the pilot is unconscious. They said, that's correct. He's out. We can't get him up. And this is what the voice said. He said, well, look, my job is to get you home safe. But I need you to do one thing. I need you to listen to my voice. You can't see me, but I can see you. I know where you are. And if you'll do what I tell you, I'll get home safe. But you've got to listen to my voice. And the man said, yes, sir. <laughs> then the voice said this, you are headed toward the mountain, about four minutes in front of you, and you will crash and die if you don't hear my voice, if you don't do what I tell you. And he began to give instructions. And he said, I did exactly what the guy told me. And we got that plane turned around. He said, now look, you're about an hour away from Anchorage Airport. I'm going to put down all the other traffic in the sky. He said that there is a lot of weather, bad weather between you and Anchorage. <clears throat> he said, I want you to pay attention to the storms that are around you. Don't pay attention to any lightning or thunder. I want you to listen to my voice, and that's all I want you to listen to. I said, yes, sir. He said, I knew I had to hear his voice. He said, and it's amazing. I didn't realize this, how many voices are in your head. He says, because a ton of voices started coming in my head. And I could see the lightning. I could feel the rain and hitting the plane and the sounds. And... But I knew I had to hear his voice. I couldn't see him. But he could see me. He said, I thought about God at that time. 
How sometimes you say, well, how do I know you're there? He said, I didn't argue with this guy. I didn't say, you want me to listen to your voice? I mean, how do I know you're going to be He said, oh, no, I didn't say any of that. I just said, yes, sir. Whatever you say, sir. You can see me. I can't see you, but I'm listening. Amen. Well, it'd be wise for us to listen to the word of God with it. He said, uh, after a, a bit, uh, the man said, okay, I'm going to bring you down now. Very soon you're going to see the runway in front of you. And at the end of the runway, there's some lights there in the shape of the cross. He said, I want you to remember this. The cross is your way home. Amen. Oh, amen. Mm. He said, the guy talked me into how to land the plane. He said, I had to land it seven times. But I landed the plane. And we were safe. He said, I went to my hotel room that night. He said, it was about 2 in the morning, and I couldn't sleep. He said, at 4 in the morning, there was a knock on the door, and uh, I answered the door, and this guy said, are you Mr. Jones? And he said, I told him, you're the voice. He said, yes, I am. <laughs> he said, one day we're going to stand before the man who gave us those words. One day we're going to stand before God. Amen. These priests, when they saw their names written in the earth, they thought about eternity. They thought about their funeral. They realized the fact that none of us going to live forever. Amen. But the man Jesus, the fountain of living water, can give us eternal life. But you've got to listen to his voice. Amen. You've got to follow his word. Let's stand together. And if you listen to his voice, and if you'll hear his word, He'll lead you to the cross, which is your way home. Amen. Well, thanks for watching the program. I hope you enjoyed it. And uh, we'd love to invite you to come out and join us for service here at Christian Life Center. We're located right here in Kingwood, Texas, behind the Fine Arts Community Center called the Nathaniel Center. Uh, our building is right behind it. We're in Building D. Our address is 806 Russell Palmer Road, Kingwood, Texas, and the zip is 77339. Listen, Christian Life Center is a church designed to meet the needs of the entire family. We have programs for single and married adults and kiddos of all ages. Vacation Bible School is coming up soon uh, in July, and your kids will love it. This year's theme is called Joy Story, and we're going to have some of the uh, vehicles from the movie Cars out here and some characters in costume. The kids are going to love it. We have a great uh, daycare and Christian school that your children can be a part of. And uh, come out and join us. If you need more information, give us a call. Our phone number is 713-398-9282. And would you consider uh, sowing a seed into the ministry? You know, you can text an offering uh, by simply calling the number on your screen, 844-297-9517. Uh, 844-297-9517. You can text an offering of any amount to that number and we'll receive it, and you'll have a record of your giving. Once again, thanks for watching. We hope you enjoyed the service, and we're looking forward to seeing you here at Christian Life Center in the near future. God bless you.